Hello viewers and welcome to another edition of the program Meet Professionals with me, IBKB. Well, Meet Professionals is a sit-down conversation program where I hold exquisite conversations with entrepreneurs, academics, change management experts and many more. Well, for today's program we have with us an esteemed professional, a private sector development expert and also an entrepreneur. Welcome to the program, Mr. Hamid. Um, thank you, Mr. Kerry. So Mr. how have you been? Well, um, I'll say it's been a very busy period. Um, I, I wouldn't want to call it post-COVID yet, because okay. we're still actively in COVID. Okay. But for some reason, it, it seems a lot of SMEs are coming out of the COVID shock, okay. in the sense that they're now reverting back to um, sort of normal operations. Okay. I mean, they still face a lot of challenges um, posed by COVID, but I, I, I think a lot of them are now bold uh, compared to when the pandemic first struck to continue their businesses almost as usual here in Sierra Leone, luckily. So yeah, um, as a result, I've got my hands full working with a lot of people, a lot of SMEs and initiatives. Okay. It's been an exciting period, challenging, but... I know, I know. Uh, um, since you're very much active in the SME sector, we're going to yeah. dive into that very um, shortly. Okay. But let us just take us through your personal journey um, from where you started as a, as a young man to where you are now as a private sector development expert mm -hmm. and also someone who has been very much active in the SME sector. That's quite an interesting um, question. Uh, I'll try to see how I can limit it to um, a more interesting cut of point. Okay. I would say well before I graduated in 2009 with a BSc um, in economics which is what I would like to um, call my my professional like official stats of my profession okay. I mean I was a lot more involved in entrepreneurship and working with SMEs and agribusinesses specifically way before that okay. I mean, reason being uh, I was raised by a single mom so my dad passed when I, I was almost 15 so two days to my 15th birthday oh and uh, I'm the eldest son to my mom so um, at a very early age you have I had so to much burden on your head yes I had to become the man in the yes. house right yes. I had to become more like my mom's best friend and um, sort of moral supporter yeah. and um, my mom went into agriculture and she's uneducated she went with a group of friends and they formed a cooperative okay. and none of them were educated so at an early age I had to become sort of their secretary okay. so I was the one basically attending workshops with them taking minutes taking notes and before you know started writing proposals for them they were not perfect I would say but I mean I, I I'm proud of myself at that age and that stage I mean I was attending the Prince of Wales school by then oh. so starting from when I was in the SS1 2 3 I was actively um, working with different pharma groups across the country attending workshops I mean workshops that were basically delivered by international experts local okay. experts and I found myself basically um, serving as a repertoire for them okay. but also most times pulling together all the um, feedback requirements from the consultants. So for example, if they ask them to go back and work on a brief proposal outline or budget or so, I had to um, do most of that. From time to time, they could manage to hire um, a professional secretary, but it was a cooperative. They, okay. they didn't always have the money to pay. Yeah, but yeah. also, it was a, a woman's world. And um, I say this with pride because I'm proud of them but also it was challenging in the sense you have a group of women who are practically uneducated and then each time they bring in um, one educated man into their fold there were a lot of risk okay. right? I mean there have been people who came and really helped them but most times it didn't always end with good experiences people try to basically um, undercut them or do other things okay. so I was the safest choice it was easier so that was my mom right? yeah, basically, for you to and, be part of the team uh, exactly and I regard all of them as my moms or either aunties so yeah. I was there to just serve them as as a child as their son not as a child as in I mean I was mature and almost an adult but as their child yeah. right so I, I I was the surest bet to do most of those things for them before you know it I mean my mom and her group they started going places I mean they won a few um, agricultural prizes my mom 
by now I think she's five times master farmer okay and I'm really proud of her also wow. proud that I, I was part of that journey so before you know she was um, beginning to attend international conferences so I mean then I started doing things like applying for international programs for them working on either their visa stuff and see how I can work on presentations and so I got that exposure even before I went to college, to college right? yeah. when I was in college I mean I used my extra time to work with them and support them okay. so by the time I graduated I would say I had already seen the benefit of um, entrepreneurship I've seen the benefit of women economic empowerment but also I was a lot more exposed to the potential of agriculture in the country okay. and so um, it's no coincidence or surprise that I, I found myself later in my career turning towards um, entrepreneurship women economic empowerment and um, agriculture in general but then um, so now to the, the cut-off point I spoke about, right? When I graduated, my first job was a banking job. Okay. So I was a marketing officer at Zenith Bank. And that was a job I prayed for anyway. I mean, I, I could remember when I was in college with some of my friends who were just, somebody would say, oh yeah, you become the World Bank banker, you become the yeah. IMF, you yeah. work for this bank. And then I, I like to be practical and realistic. I said, yeah. I like this new bank and all I want is really to work for Zenith Bank. And, and so Allah wills, um, God answered my prayers. And um, it was my dream job, but strangely, I spent only four months on my dream job. Okay. Um, uh, th this is the interesting part of my yeah. career. I, I think if I, if, if I didn't get that job right, maybe I'll be regretting to date and say, oh God, I wanted to be a banker. I wanted a banking job. But God knows how he does things. So he wanted me to really experience the banking job and realize I mean, for myself, that maybe I wasn't cut out to be a banker. Yeah. Um, I, I learned a lot on that job, but um, it wasn't a pleasant experience. Okay. On that job, I first learned that um, a lot of young graduates are in a serious predicament in this country, okay. in a situation where employers take advantage of them. Most of the employers in this country, especially some foreign employers back then, apply and adopt um, theory X management, yeah. where they intimidate, they a very almost hard say, approach. and hard approach. And uh, by the time we had an MD who would say, oh, I know what's out there, there is no job. Oh, yeah, look at the door, you can walk out if you want, you can go. Yeah. So, so they were basically taking advantage of the situation. Yeah. But I also saw that um, we can tend to be a bunch of uh, timid people in this country because I saw people who by my rating were established professionals they had worked for 10 years or more some of them I mean had properties they had houses I mean they have good savings yet they were enduring that system yeah. yet they couldn't speak up yet they couldn't challenge they couldn't resist or leave yeah. uh, I as a young graduate and professional I was baffled I was like I feel you have enough capital to go and start your, your own, business, own business, your own yeah, enterprise. Yeah. Or even if you go home without a job, you won't starve. Yeah. Like you are in a good position. And then we decided to petition um, this um, particular MD because it, it, it was becoming too much. It was my f first two weeks and I said, I'm gonna sign. I was among the first who signed. And there were people that we looked up to who signed fake signatures. Like people, like I said, who were established professionals who should be a lot more bolder yeah. than a new recruit or so. They were scared of being the, the whistleblowers at the yeah, time. and the MD could say, oh, because even the new boy signed, he signed. I have no regrets. <laughs> like, uh, as far as I was concerned, I wanted to be part of the team and fight for the team and fight for what I believe um, was right. Yeah. Anyway, um, I couldn't take it. I left after um, four months. I actually left for pay cut. It was the best decision I ever took in my entire life. Okay. Um, when I left, in less than a year, about 15 staffs left. Then obviously, I mean, she got deported and things really got worse. But my point is, um, the lesson I learned there is that we tend to be unenterprising. We tend to be too scared to venture in the wild and take risk. Yeah. I mean, even as um, a four month professional by then, I knew that environment wasn't right for me. Yeah. I knew I was gonna leave sooner or later. I mean, when I found my next job and I was supposed to start in a few weeks, I resigned with immediate effect. Everyone was like, oh, you want, why don't you wait for your salary or benefit? I'm like, I want none of this. I'm resigning today with immediate effect. I, left, I dropped my letter, I never came back to the bank, never came back. Um, then I went to the International Rescue Committee 
I took a pay cut of almost about 500,000 units. And my salary was within the range of 1.3 million, and then I, I went to about 900,000 units. I mean, for a man with my um, responsibility at that age, it, it may seem like a terrible decision, right? I mean, of I course, had my yeah. three sisters, they were attending school, I mean, they were attending and private school. And you the school. eldest son, Yes, so. yes, I was the one paying for their fees from, from that salary. Yeah. It means I had to sacrifice a lot more other things. Right. Gladly, I love material wealth, but I'm not a materialistic person, right? I could sacrifice all of that for the important things. When I took up that job, it was where my journey as, um, a business development expert in a professional space actually started. Okay. So at the International Rescue Committee, we pioneered, so it was a youth works project, meaning it was um, support to youth and livelihood. And then we pioneered for the first time in the West African region a concept referred to as micro-franchising. Okay. So to break this down, basically, uh, micro-franchising is where you look at big businesses that are established and successful, mm -hmm. and then you replicate them with their brand in smaller versions, in our case for youths. So they use the same brand, they ride on the brand, and then they're able to penetrate the market because the brand is already known in the market. Okay. So um, our franchisors, as we call um, the big brands, so we call them franchisors, and we call the um, youth, the SMEs, franchisees, right? So the franchisors were mainly, um, it was then Celtel, so it was Celtel, Africel, we had Ice Ice Baby, we had Lion Bakery, yeah. and it, so the basically, yes, we had Flash, so Flash Mobile Money. So what my job basically was to um, first recruit um, youth across the country, put them together and train them in a very specific um, training toolkit. So when I when I joined that job, one of the first things I mean they did was first I got trained in ILO business skills, which to date I mean has proven to be really valuable to me. But I also got trained and certified in a toolkit that was um, pioneered in America and Canada that was called um, um, the Street Kids International Toolkit. And there was a character in the whole training called Speed. So basically, the toolkit was called Speed's Choice. So the choice that Speed made, right? Okay. So Speed's Choice. Basically, uh, it was a voluminous training manual, and then I became sort of the expert in that training. And so for almost a year, I spent my time going around the country training youths. A lot of whom I see today, some of them are my colleagues, some of them are in great places, and I see them and smile. Because I was a youth myself. A lot of them were, I mean, by far older than me at the yeah. time just that i was a graduate and i was meant to be their facilitator because in that space we don't say tutor or lecturer, lecturer you're a facilitator yeah. Yeah. Right? right so um i found myself recruiting youth training them in business skills and life skills as we call them at the time and then i also spent six months to help them set up their businesses so we'll provide um startup capital we actually buy the stock for them and we build a small kiosk for them brand it with, with the franchise or choosing for that particular business okay. and then we set up for them in that kiosk i did a lot of that here in freetown in kenema in bo in Kono, and that was how i got to travel the rest of the country i would say to this date i've worked for at least two weeks stretch in every single district in the country wow. like work and stay there so i i know i know the country inside out um in that sense so from the ILC and then um, my, my career basically took a very accelerated um, turn. I mean, I got recruited um, at the African Minerals as a business development lead for um, the Bombali um, region, which by the time was a massive job. Like, you had a lot of people, people with masters, PhDs, who were vying for those jobs, yeah. right? And um, for somebody who was earning about 980,000 at the time, it was a mat, like, my salary jumped like almost over 500 percent, right? I mean, I got to have um, a driver, I and mean, a very a, young a, a man. White, a white <laughs> Prado and my driver that was driving yeah. me around. It, it was transformational. Yeah. But um, I mean, if you're a young person and you're listening to this, I think one of the things I always look back on from that experience is when you actually follow your heart, you follow your desires, you, you take risk, you make credible and um, tough decisions, they pay off, right? right. Um, if I didn't leave my banking job and took that pay cut, yeah. this was never going to happen. Right? Yeah. I think I got that job at the African Minerals because of my experience at the um, IRC. Yes. And a few years down the line, I found myself basically recruiting colleagues who were a lot more senior than me at the bank yeah. and working with them. Right. It was because I was bold enough to look at the system and take a decision. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the African Minerals, basically, I found myself doing almost what I was doing at the IRC, yeah. but at a more magnified yeah. stage. Yeah. So I was working scale. with yeah, communities where 
where I mean operations of the mining company may have destabilized their livelihoods and see how we could then find alternative livelihoods for them okay. so this will be basically setting up different businesses for them providing similar trainings and see how they could also tap opportunities around the mining area okay because you know if you have mining establishment one of the things we we haven't done successfully in this country is how we tap on um, opportunities around mining area right, right. we right. sit and watch um, foreign companies come in and also step into that space yeah if you have a mining establishment establishment transportation for example become a very big business yeah. right transportation both locally but also import and exports I mean shipment becomes massive um, procurement of food items become massive and I when I was there I mean food services and procurement were offered by all foreign companies yeah. so it was basically um, CIS it, it, it was basically all the Protec uh, even the contractors around the mining companies were mostly um, foreign companies, foreign, uh, right? Yeah. And, and so the, the objective then was to see how we could build the capacity of local businesses local, yeah. who can then tap into those um, businesses. Yeah. It didn't really quite come to fruition. We didn't really achieve um, the objective as planned okay. because there were a lot of competing um, interests at play. But also fairness to the mining company, the focus then was really to complete the wheel so they can start exporting iron ore. So I find myself mostly um, providing support to um, rail works and see how we can manage um, community engagement and community liaison, but also social um, challenges around that area so that the rail work can um, go on smoothly and okay. as fast as um, possible. Right. Um, I was determined to see how we could really bring about that change as planned. It, regardless of the challenges yeah. but then um, I got a golden opportunity really to study for my masters I got a scholarship I mean as I said I mean been raised by a single and educated mom um, I, I, I like I'm a very practical person. I didn't deceive myself or think that um, opportunities are going to come falling on my lap. Yeah, you went on looking I, for them. Yes, I knew I needed to make them, right? And when they do come, it meant the world to me because right. I couldn't afford, for example, paying my own fees to go and study abroad. I don't have that kind of connection. I mean, there was no way I expected I could get some um, scholarship based on connection. So I was looking for private scholarships and then I, I won this particular one. So I approached my employers then at the time. I wanted to go on leave. That wasn't possible. And then I said, well, I'm going to resign. And at the moment, I could remember my late brother was working with me. He thought I was crazy. And he said, people have PhDs. They're coming here. They're fighting. People yeah. are dying to get a job at Africa. Meaning, like, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. People are here getting rich. Yeah. I mean, you don't yeah. even have anything here. You're about to leave. It was a tough decision, so I like to pray over things. So I, I prayed over this particular um, decision, and my conviction was that I, I needed to go. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, like I was convinced I needed to go. Okay. And so I said to him, uh, if I'm not getting leave, I'm, I'm, I'm resigning. And I resigned. I mean, it, w it was quite a hurdle because there were challenges even before I got to um, um, Italy at the time and started my masters but, but that's that right that's for another day um, I went and then it, it changed my perception forever Every, everything I saw I mean how private sector and business contribute to development in the Western world because I, I, I used most of my holiday period and break to travel across Europe and see many countries and just interact visit some factories and see and just sometimes go to the green fields and just understand how the system work. I realized the bedrock of their system is actually private sector. So I, I was pretty much determined to, when I come back, to go into private the sector. Private sector. I mean, I came back, I spent a few um, months in Bo, working with different businesses, doing, because I, I opted to do my research for my second master's here in Sierra Leone. Okay. I mean, I had the option to go to other places, but I, I wanted to put into practice um, some of the theories and concepts I was building oh. in my mind already. Okay. So I chose to come to Sierra Leone to do um, my research for my second um, master's because I did my first master's in law and economics and then I did another one in economics and finance. So then I, I did my research here and in that period I saw a lot of things. I got a really um, good job at the German International Corporation. So I was a project advisor for their regional resource governance project. So that was um, the Mano River Union. So okay. basically Liberia, Guinea, Guinea. Australia yeah. and the Ivory Coast. So I was um, the project advisor. It was a really high level job. Yeah. My engagement was mostly, I mean, directors, ministers, and yeah, it was pretty much high level. I mean, I, my, I, my, one of my friends used to say, 
my my office was fake. You know, if you go to my office, it, it was this big and have a setting of a minister's office or so. I was like, talking about my pocket boss. So I mean, anyway, um, it was a job I really enjoyed. Uh, um, it was a space where I learned a whole lot, but it wasn't quite connected to business as I would prefer. Okay. Even though um, at GIZ and um, we, we were also working around mining areas, and part of the project was um, local development in mining areas. Okay. And some of the things I did on that project, and I'm proud of is basically and um, we get to launch the mines to mines project um around um Lonsal. so basically you have the london mining project and you have a lot of youth who wanted to work within the mining sector but they didn't have the skills so we had this partnership there to see how the st joseph's vocational training center can train some of these youth so they can have the required capacity to work in a mining area so we call it mines to mines so, so basically we take you off the, the, the mines we work on your mines right um, it was a really successful project. In addition to that, also, um, there were a lot of locals who were very angry, but also was a big challenge for the mining companies, but they didn't have the basic capacity to have that level of training. So basically, we figured out a way to see how we can provide basic training for them in their L1, so meaning in this case, in Korea. Yeah. Right? And in order for us to um, see how we can incentivize them to attend the trainings, always we develop um, a VSL scheme, which is a village savings and loan scheme. So if you know, and, and we deposited an initial amount to their cash box and everything. And so if you know, if you put money outside period, you get to go work home yeah. in a particular share and start a business. That was an incentive for them to really participate um, in that training. But I also found myself working in the policy and legal space because um, GIZ was taking the lead on um, fine tuning most of the mining laws at the time. And so in particular, I was coordinating the working group for the uh, um, Community Development Fund. In our mines and minerals agreement, there is a provision that um, every mining company should contribute a certain percentage to consolidate the fund mm -hmm. that should go towards community development. But we needed to carve out um, an effective governance I mean, for that fund, which was mostly rooted in business, right? So the communities get to use them in a very entrepreneurial uh, way. But as I said, as interesting as this was, it wasn't um, business like for me. So I didn't last there long. It's quite a shame because I, I I feel I had a lot of problems with the GIZ system. Mm -hmm. I love the job. I love my colleagues. I learned a whole lot, but I wanted to pursue my passion. So then I left, and then I went. That was in 2014, January 2014. I left, and since then I went into business development proper. Like since then, I've only done things that are specifically related to business development. In particular, um, I was initially um, one of the Managers of intervention lead on the defeat funded um, solar project. So it was, um, yeah, selling um, opportunities for business action. And then later I became a senior um, manager. And I, I, I was on that project till closure. In that period, I worked with hundreds of businesses across the country. I mean, of all sizes, small and really, really very big um, corporations. We pioneered a lot of um, things within the space. I mean, we started um, doing the first pitch night in, in Sweden, basically, yeah. Yeah, at our rooftop office at the maze by then. And then before we closed, we wanted to look for somebody who could um, inherit some of our programs. So we passed on our pitch nights to Innovation Axis, so the Freetown um, pitch night. Okay. So, yeah, so we worked with them to um, basically roll out a few together before we closed. And then they took over and they've done really, really amazing stuff so with that platform. We had our business seminars that we started. And then before we close out, we passed that on to um, Cornet. And then Cornet, together we did a few at the African American corner. And now that has become a really huge thing. I mean, I, people invite me now these days to the African American corner for different business seminars, coffees, yeah. hackathons, and things like that. We also um, implemented the first unreasonable labs um, in Sierra Leone, for which we partnered with um, Sensi Tech Hall. And so there were a lot of things we did that were pioneering, and um, I would say sort of paradigm shift. Okay. Right? We, we, we shifted the norms and behavior and perception towards um, entrepreneurship. I mean, some of the most vibrant um, entrepreneurship um, WhatsApp groups, for example, we created on that project. Okay. Like this year, the entrepreneurs, I mean, the so first that, That's one key area that um, we're going to dive into real quick. Yeah. Because um, your participation and involvement in the entrepreneurial sector in Sierra is very much, very much remarkable. Of course, you've been featured in a lot of um, entrepreneurial discussions, uh, business development discussions, and these are things that has helped develop the mindsets of entrepreneurs. You know, so um, I want us to move a bit further 
So what does the SF accelerator do? Because um, for me, they've been so much active in development, development of agribusinesses in this area. So briefly, before we go for break, let us go through what are their operations. Yeah. So I'm um, currently, um, as you know, I'm the TA facility manager of the SL Accelerator project, which is a World Bank funded project implemented to the Ministry of Trade and Industry yeah. um, within the government of um, Sierra Leone. Um, basically, we were here to accelerate agro-processing businesses. So we have a very um, specific um, bias for agro-processing businesses. So that meaning if you are in agriculture, you are um, engaged in value addition of any sort. So basically if you um, produce um, rice, you um, basically meal and package. If you do poultry, you sell eggs or you I mean, process boilers. I mean if you do coffee, if basically um, you produce snacks or anything agricultural um, right, in that sense, you are our target. So what we do basically is um, we recruit these SMEs to a competitive um, 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 bidding process. So we, we launch applications, eligible SMEs that meet the basic criteria would apply, and then we screen them and come up with a short list, and we pass on the short list to an independent advising committee. So one of the things, um, and, and this stemmed from the experience on all the other projects in the previous years, right, was that we, we decided to put together a very friendly and independent and experienced panel which includes academia, so I mean, for example, business for example is represented. It includes the private sector, it includes other businesses who basically um, operate um, in a similar space as the SMEs. It includes um, government representatives. It also includes um, people from within other innovation um, access, right? But also, interestingly, we have a presentation from the Women um, Market Association. So when a woman applicant is coming there, even if you are uneducated, you have someone you can relate with, right? Mm -hmm. It makes you comfortable. Yeah, yeah. You, you have a seat on the table actively. And so this independent um, panel is, is the body that is responsible for advising the um, facility. So usually when I want to take the key decision together with the team, I will have to um, invite the advising committee just inform and communicate them and they will either come up with uh, suggestions or validations or okay. even sometimes um, objections. And so once they are um, full, and, and when we select the SMEs, we have what we call a selection conference. So they come there with their actual product, they pitch, and the advisory committees have the um, leverage to go to, if they're not satisfied, they can go to your business site and really see what you're doing, or what you claim you're doing is actually um, in existence. And then we select the um, cohorts, we call them cohorts every group. Once we select the cohorts. Yeah, so uh, um, I think the aspect of the cohort is something I'd like us to elevate more on. So um, I'd like to hold you there and uh, we'll go for a short break. Uh, of course, uh, this is Speech Professionals with me, IBKB. Um, I have with me Mr. Hamid Mara. We've been moving the conversation um, from where he started to where he is now as a private um, sector development expert. And he's so much um, active. Um, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Sierra Leone. So we'll go for a short break and we will be right back. Again, viewers, um, this is the program Meet Professionals with me, IBKB. Well, Meet Professionals is a platform where I hold high level conversations with entrepreneurs, experts, policy makers, academics, researchers, and many more. We've been moving the conversation around the agribusiness sector as well as our entrepreneurial sector in Sierra Leone. I have with me Mr. Hamid Mara. Welcome to the show again. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Pleasure. Okay, so now let's now dive in deep to um, the agricultural landscape in Sierra Leone with regards to agribusinesses. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I think before we um, had the break, I was just concluding on what we do at SL Accelerator. Yes, sir. So primarily once we recruit those SMEs, we spend um, a four to six months period where we build their capacity in different areas of their businesses. So this could be um, in their financial management, in their operations management, I mean, their HR systems, their market um, penetration. And once we're confident they're in a good place to absorb investment, we then take them to the next stage where we provide um, a matching grant to them. Okay. So they can then um, implement those strategies and invest in the growth and expansion of their um, business. Um, building on that, I would say 
One of the um, reasons that led to the World Bank and the government deciding on having this kind of project is because together, collectively, they recognize the potential of the agricultural um, sector in the country. In the country, uh, yeah, yeah. I think first, um, it's a no-brainer that um, our biggest sector and our largest employer in the country is the agricultural space. Okay. So um, um, our labor force, the largest employment in the country is within the agricultural space. Our largest contributor to GDP is agriculture. Um, so clearly, agriculture holds the biggest promise um, for development um, in our country by virtue of um, participation in the sector, which okay. simply means if it's developed, we're able to redistribute wealth in a more um, far-reaching way. Yeah. I mean, that said, if there's any market that is going to remain um, either constant or with a growth trajectory in the world, mm -hmm. it's food. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the world's population is growing. Our population is growing rapidly, mm -hmm. and the one thing we're always going to need is food. Sadly, in Sierra Leone, um, we're a net importer. We import almost everything, everything we consume. Everything. Right? Yeah. And uh, what is interesting is the fact that for almost everything we import, we grow the raw materials here in Sierra Leone, or we have a potential to grow the raw materials. First, we've got vast arable unused lands. So That's very much important. Yeah. When, I, when I speak of land, I, I, I want to, I mean, differentiate um, across one land that is already occupied, land that we may not need to farm because um, we need to um, maintain um, our ecological footprint and the yeah, environment, yeah. but land that is arable, that is unused, that is there. We have vast land that is there that is not part of our protected forest that we've not been able to cultivate yet. And these are fertile lands. Um, we get rain almost half of the year. Yeah, for, we yeah. get sunshine almost always. So we've got a very um, decent climatic um, condition, yeah. condition yeah. to really grow almost anything we consume. I'm an investor and um, you're able to say, Two years ago, I started this venture and did a pilot, right? I used my own money or money I got from friends or relatives, I mean, your savings. And then um, this is how much I've learned, right? And I've, I've developed this formula and this prototype, this product. Yeah. Now all I need is to scale this and go to market. Here is the, the data on the market opportunity, both locally and internationally. That's a very compelling story. Yeah. It's 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 it, it's more credible and it makes an investor want to um no put their more money, right? Put their no money. more put their money um in the venture as opposed to if you just come up with a proposal and say, Oh yeah, I want to go into agriculture. So I think a lot of people who want to go into agriculture fall into um the trap of just proposal writing. They just write proposals and move around the proposal and say, Oh yeah, I want to do this. The point is everyone has ideas nowadays. And nowadays right? banks don't get moved exactly, by that. Exactly. Who is going to bank on you and believe in you just because you have a proposal? I mean, but when you've taken your time, you've believed in the idea enough to invest your own money, a yeah. lot of people are going to um, bank on you and want to work together with you. More so if you're, you're already having traction, it's easy for somebody to invest because remember they're investing, they yeah. want to make money. You may have failed. Exactly, exactly. You have to show them a credible um, story and trajectory that you they could make money yeah. um, in the process. So that's one, and I, and I would say also, um, we need to reevaluate and 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 attach more value to um, business development services because a lot of these um, SMEs who venture in, into agriculture face many challenges, technical challenges, and um, we need to improve um, our services of for um, agricultural extension in the country. Okay. We have very limited um, extension officers who are active in the private space, and so that's an opportunity for a lot of people to step into and provide extension services to many people who want to step into agriculture. Um, if somebody wants to go into um, onion production, who do they go to? Yeah. I mean, apart from coming to somebody like myself who work on a program, I have my obligations. Who in the private space do you go to as an expert that can basically take you through or provide services to you right, in right. basically um, producing onion? We don't have this kind of services um, in the country in the agricultural space. And therefore, it becomes very difficult for somebody who is not an agriculturist themselves to venture without spending many years to learn to become an agriculturist yourself. You need not do that, basically. Yeah. You can learn in the process, but you should be able to um, establish with the required services um, around you. Okay. So we lack some of these services. We lack um, a lot of um, logistical um, support functions around the sector. Okay. And this is where um, government partners and other programs can come in and basically um, provide those support functions. And as much as the SMEs themselves, I mean, try to see how they can take a more 
realistic and strategic approach, i.e. you first learn, you start small, you pilot, yeah. you fail, you crack a code for success, yeah. and then you look for um, finance to basically um, expand, or you even grow organically. Okay. Meaning, as you start selling your small yeah. harvest, you keep Until expanding you big, over yeah. time. Yeah. And um, I would say, let us be opportunistic, right? Mm. This is why initially I was um, a bit hesitant to tell somebody to go into rice, for example, because it's a bit more challenging. But you have other sub sectors, crop sectors, where you can make a lot of good money. Yeah. The export market for honey is quite vast. Like we, we produce some of the best honeys um, in this country, in the far southeast, in the far north, we produce some of the best honey. The market for cashew nuts, even raw cashew nuts, meaning you don't have to have a machine to process the cashew nuts here. You just harvest, you dry it, and the market for cashew nuts is very, very good. It's massive and it's growing. If you have a machine that can crack cashew nuts, it's even better. The, ma the market is quite, it's a multi-billion dollar um, market. Obviously, um, for tubers and, and like um, Irish potatoes, onions the market is quite massive both locally and internationally, internationally. Yeah. so there are a lot of things that we can produce here quite easily I say well, not quite but relatively easily yeah. as yeah. compared to um, other, other things parts, we struggle yeah. with yeah. and um, I, I don't know I think we all should be having farms right now yeah. and I have a couple of farms and I, I keep <laughs> expanding my farm gradually at the end of this conversation I'll be thinking of getting mine too you should you should <laughs> you should I, I, I feel it's a no-brainer that every Salonian should think of starting their own um, farm um, oh, right yeah. now because agriculture is the way to go I yeah mean, you right they said right I mean the rest of the world especially the West is going to start leaning on Africa yeah. to feed their population and that we should so be ready to accept that opportunity exactly otherwise exactly. they will take again and we import Exactly. Into exactly. Our country. Or they will start coming here, establish corporations. They farm here. They make money here and take the money away. Yes, yeah. Which yeah. we've seen in so many um, different forms um, yeah. already. Okay. So thank you so so much for that elaborate discussion. Of course, if you do have your own farm, you should be thinking of having your own now. Yeah. So now let us move finally to what advice do you have for young um, Sierra Leoneans, whether they're in college, whether they are not. Uh, who would want to be in the field of agriculture or agribusiness or entrepreneurship? What would be your advice to them? Yeah. So the first thing I would say, um, I have learned um, that the pathway to generating wealth, uh, and, and I, when I say wealth, uh, wealth is not a greedy um, objective. So you, there's, there's so many reasons you may seek to be rich for, right? Yeah. It's not because you're selfish. If you're rich, you can help so many people. Yeah. That's what you want to achieve. You can help course, yourself, yeah. your family, yeah. your community, your country. So the pathway to generating wealth is basically um, starting your own business. Uh, it's very difficult to be rich whilst working for someone, for someone else, exactly. right? But if you generate your own business, you can easily become rich in so many things. You can become rich in the things that money cannot buy. You can help so much people and create so much um, impact. Yeah. So if you're a young person out there, you should, it's a no brainer that you should start thinking of starting your own business. And when you, you want to do business, obviously, you have to be opportunistic. You have to look for where the opportunities are, where you're guaranteed to make the biggest impact, but also um, the biggest profits, right? And you may want to do your small market research and then validate. So now I'm, I'm, I'm jumping that step for you. Basically, I'm telling you based on credible research, I mean by credible institutions and organizations, agriculture is a way to go for you if you're a Sierra Leonean. Your biggest opportunity may be in agriculture as we've um, discussed here already. You're sitting on multi-million dollar um, crop sectors just locally just within our local market. It's not even export yet, just import substitution. These are multi-million dollar um, 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 subsectors. So your opportunity is in agriculture. You should venture into agriculture. Now you may be wondering uh, how, where do you start? And so um, um, here is what I usually say to young people, and I keep repeating this, you don't need money to be an entrepreneur. You don't necessarily need money to start a um, business. You don't. All you need is an idea that you, you work on developing. And when I say an idea, it's not a thought. A lot of people think an idea is just one random thought. Any random thought or vision is not necessarily an idea. You need to develop your idea. To develop your idea, you have to put in the required work. You have to basically um, do a small mini research. You don't need to hire a team. Research, Go yeah. to the market, check, validate the market, validate the production requirements, validate how you can access the resources, the land, or whatever. And this forms the totality of your idea. Once you have your idea, I mean, I used to say a lot of us young people, 
well, other young people younger than myself, you have very expensive phones. Phones that usually will cost three, four millions. I <laughs> About mean, five you, billion. You do time. your hair and you spend millions. <laughs> I mean, just a cut of that money may be sufficient for you to just start. Yeah. And a lot of us come from villages. I mean, I seen we have roots in our villages where we can acquire, I mean, land for cheap. Without even paying, in fact. Nothing, right? Yeah. So why don't you just buy a few seeds and start piloting? Start small. Test. It's very dangerous to want to blow big um, um, automatically. Some people yeah. get lucky, but it's a very dangerous strategy. Because yeah. if you fail, you fail dramatically. Yeah. So you go and start small, start piloting. Once you start producing and selling, Believe me, if your idea is compelling, you're motivated enough, and you're able to demonstrate examples, there are people out there who can bank on you, who can believe you enough to work together with you. And here is also the trick. When a lot of people look for um, funding and they start business, they go about it with a very greedy and um, protectionist um, mentality. They want people to put in money, but they're not flexible enough to let go some of their shares. Yeah. There are many smart ways you can acquire funding. If you've piloted your business, you have tangible um, results of um, progress, right? That shows traction. You will approach Mr. Kibbe, for example, and say, I have my farm um, in, in color. I've been growing potatoes for two years. Here yeah. is the, the result so far, and this is the potential. Yeah. But I don't have the required capital to um, expand as much as I want to. I mean, why don't you buy 20% shares on the business and invest money? Yeah. Mr. Kebe may be busy as a lecturer, but he has some extra cash, right? That he will think, okay, agriculture has potential, and this man is, this man or woman, I would prefer, is very serious and I've yeah. seen results. I'll yeah. put some money here exactly. and see how we go, I right? Agree. Yeah. You, you, so, you, so you give up um, some shares and potentially um, Allow some the benefits to grow. later, exactly. But from my experience, you may not just want to give that money. If this person turns out to be credible and you begin to see progress, you begin to invest your emotions in the business. Exactly. You start putting more effort, start yeah. working to develop, you start to even more. putting more money yeah. beyond what you initially gave yeah. because yeah. You, yeah. your shares are invested in that business. You yeah. know, if it grows, you're going to benefit yeah. um, together. Yeah. So these are all smart ways of acquiring funding and going about it. Mm -hmm. And I feel um, we don't necessarily have to wait until we get the whole world money to start. Let's start small. Let's identify the, 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 the um, quick wins, the low-hanging fruit, and then start there. Let us don't wait for some foreigner to come and start tapping these opportunities, and all we can do is sit by, watch, and hate. Yeah. It doesn't help us. It doesn't take us anywhere. So if you don't have a farm already, you're a young person, it's about time you start planning to become a millionaire, and agriculture is your way to go. Thank you so much, Mr. Hamid. I like that. If you don't have a farm, I think uh, Mr. Hamid said, and um, we should go get ours now. Okay. So finally, before we, we end the conversation, um, this platform provides uh, mentorship opportunities for a lot of young people who are viewing this program. So we're also asking, um, are you open to mentorship opportunities for young people? if we contact you from this platform? Obviously, I, I would say um, all of my professional life, what I've been doing best is actually providing mentorship to young people in the form of training facilitations, but one-to-one -one mentorship. Yeah. That was why, in fact, um, myself and two other Sierra Leoneans decided to um, form um, MentorX Africa, yeah. which is one of the biggest mentorship platforms um, across um, Africa. We are now in almost 40 countries, and we're translated in um, French as well, so in both Anglophone and Francophone countries. Obviously, Obviously, um, mentorship is what I love to do, and I'm quite open to um, providing um, mentorship to a deserving mentor. I like to add that caveat because I see how a lot of people um, demotivate mentors around here because they misconstrue the role of the, the mentor. mentor. A lot of people think the mentor is it's so many things that the mentor shouldn't be, yeah. and they also approach mentorship um, without the required discipline and um, respect. So to a deserving mentor who's serious enough, obviously um, I'm happy to provide mentorship. Okay, you've heard from the boss and the mentor himself, Mr. Hamid Ma. Thank you so much for joining okay. our program today. We so appreciate your coming and sharing your thoughts on the entrepreneurial as well as the SME sector in Sierra Leone, as well as the potential um, agriculture has and how do we benefit from that so this is where we end our program today we are going to draw down the curtains for today's edition of the program meet professionals with me IBKB make sure you subscribe and um, you get regular updates for any other videos that will be uploaded I thank you so much take it easy goodbye for now <laughs>